It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Health. Yesterday, the Minister of Health was asked by journalists whether the government is considering further privatizing our health care system. The Minister said that the government is exploring all options. Is this government looking to the private and for-profit sector to take over health care services that are currently publicly delivered? And to reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, thank you for the question and allow me to clarify or to repeat what I said yesterday, which was, in Ontario, you use your OHIP card to access health care services in the province of Ontario, and that will continue. Here, 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 here. Supplementary question. Thank you. Well, that was hardly a no. Um, speaker, again to the minister. Reliance on private health care providers will plunge our public hospitals and health care systems deeper into crisis. Bill 124 is draining staff from the public system, and private staffing agencies are gouging hospitals. Will the minister allow private health care companies into Ontario, siphoning doctors, nurses, and health care workers out of the public system? Minister of health. Thank you, Speaker. To be clear, Ontario has one of the strongest publicly funded health care systems in the world. It is world-renowned, first class, it's second in terms of how much we spend on publicly funded health care. That will continue in the province of Ontario. What I referenced yesterday was innovation. We should not be afraid of innovation. We do it very well Order. in the province of Ontario, and we will continue to work with our partners to make sure that that innovation is encouraged and can continue. Thank you, Speaker. And the final supplementary. So I take that as a yes. Uh, again, to the minister, private corporations have a financial responsibility to generate profit. That's a direct conflict of interest with their responsibility to offer affordable, accessible, and high-quality care, regardless of the patient's ability to pay. Does the minister think patients should have to start paying for care they now receive as of right? Respond, the Minister of Health. No, no, no. OHIP cards are used in the province of Ontario to fund publicly funded health care systems. That will continue under our watch. There has never been a change where we will continue to fund OHIP services through our health care system. What you are worried about unnecessarily is that we would be encouraging innovation. And Order. there are many examples of innovation that are happening in the province today that we want to expand, not the least of which examples that with Ontario OHN, Ontario uh, Hospital Network, and Sick Kids, and many others, which I'm happy to highlight if the member opposite is not aware of that innovation that is happening in the province of Ontario today. I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. The next question. Member for Toronto Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Just two days ago, I received a letter from a nurse in my riding. He shared a story about one of his patients. My patient has fluid filling up in his lungs, and he's less able to breathe. His oxygen is not coming into his body with each passing day. It's not an exaggeration to say that he is drowning slowly. He needs an urgent procedure to remove the fluid. This should have happened last week. It was scheduled for last week. It has not happened because of the staffing shortage. My question, what will the government do to help the suffering patient in the next 24 hours, and what will they do in the next 10 days to alleviate this cr staffing crisis that we see in our hospitals? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and welcome to the member opposite to her new role as a parliamentarian. You know, there is no doubt that staffing challenges impact patient care, and that is why we have been working proactively to make sure that where we need those services, we have them. Uh, we've worked with Ontario Health to, for example, ensure that if an emergency department is at risk of closure, we um, 
work with Ontario Health to make sure that physicians who are prepared and willing to travel to other jurisdictions have that opportunity. They may travel for a couple of hours to go to a uh, hospital network that they're not traditionally tied into. Uh, we've done that work. We need to do more of it, of course, but I want to reinforce that we have done a lot already. We have 10,500 new healthcare professionals working in the province of Ontario that we did not have without the innovation and the proactive approach that we have taken as a government. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Um, with respect to the question I had was really about what are you going to do in the next 24 hours. So my, my constituent further invites all of us to consider this. Reflect on what it would be like to be unable to breathe during every single breath that you're drawing. Please think about what it's like when your lungs are filled with water. Reflect upon that. Speaker, no one in the Ontario hospitals should have to experience that agony because they are waiting for an urgent procedure. My question again is, will this government listen to healthcare professionals and to implement the solutions that are needed to address the healthcare crisis and, uh, and this understaffing crisis in our hospitals? And the Minister of Health. So again, through you, Speaker, we of course have provided additional funding to hospitals to ensure that their emergency departments and other uh, backlog surgeries can proceed in a faster way. In some cases, that involves additional funding to allow those uh, surgery suites to be open longer into the evening, over the weekends. Um, that kind of innovation, those kinds of investments mean that we can deal with the backlog and get through the number of people who are waiting for these critical services. We'll continue that work. We'll make sure that as, as hospitals, as medical practitioners need the support, they will get it. They have the province of Ontario and the people of Ontario su supporting them in that role. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Uh, thank you again, Speaker. That issue, this issue is not related and, and restricted to just one patient or one hospital, as we, as we all know. Another constituent of mine, Gregory, needs urgent abdominal surgery. But because of the surgical backlog that we've already heard a lot about, he was told to find a doctor outside of Ontario, never mind outside of the city or in another neighbourhood. He called my office to say this, do you really think anyone in my condition is ready to find care outside of the province. Speaker, health care workers have told the government how to clear the surgical backlog, hire 30,000 nurses, repeal Bill 124, and fund public health care at the rate of inflation. Will the government put these recommendations into action, or are they really just setting up the excuse for privatization? Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. You know, as part of our plan to reopen, we've actually expanded by almost uh, over a thousand beds in ICU capacity. It means that things like the surgery backlog can be dealt with proactively. We understand that there are many challenges that have happened as a result of individuals who could not access their primary care practitioner, who didn't have the ability to get that diagnostic imaging. We have now essentially eliminated the, the imaging, the backlog that we've had in the diagnostic piece. We're working very well with our healthcare partners to make sure that we focus as equally on the surgery backlog. That work will continue. But in the meantime, I think it's really important for people to understand that a lot of this work happened because we understood Response. we needed the capacity in the province of Ontario to be able to stay open and to continue to serve the people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. My, my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, Chris Hodgins lives in London West and had to take his 84-year-old mother to University Hospital ER for severe hip pain. She waited 16 and a half hours before being seen and then waited two hours more in the treatment room. Another patient with acute appendicitis waited five hours longer than Chris's mother. Speaker, how many hours will Londoners have to wait before this government finally Finally, acknowledges that our healthcare system is in crisis, or does the entire ER have to shut down? Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker. You know, it is absolutely critical that we address some of these delays and wait times. It's why, as part of our $3.3 billion investment into the hospital sector, we also dedicated $300 million specifically to reduce surgery backlogs from delays or cancelled surgeries and procedures due to COVID-19. That work will continue, but we need to drive that innovation and encourage that so that opportunities can be made available and we can expand, frankly, surgical suite timelines. We can, we can offer incentives to physicians, which we've already done, to make sure that they can operate and get those surgery backlogs down in the same way that we have, of course, with the diagnostic testing already dealt with. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government may think that privatization is the answer, but Londoners disagree. Like many Londoners, a constituent told me that she and her husband have been unable to find a new family doctor. After being turned away from overwhelmed walk-in clinics, they felt they had no other option than to pay to join a private medical service in order to access basic medical care. They have the means to pay, but feel that this is fundamentally wrong. Speaker, why is this government more interested in promoting privatized two-tier two health care than in making the urgent investments that our public health care system and our exhausted health care workers so desperately need. To respond, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. It is exactly why we have expanded residency spaces. It is exactly why I have worked with my colleagues to make sure that we have additional health care practitioners, doctors, nurses, personal support workers getting trained right here in the province of Ontario. It is precisely why we have ensured that the College of Nurses, the College of Physicians and Surgeons have been directed to deal Order. quickly with the individuals who, who are living in the province of Ontario who want that license, who want to be able to practice as a nurse, as a physician, will continue that work. We are in working with the colleges to make sure that they expedite those uh, reviews and ultimately licensures, and we'll continue that work. But it's not a individual piece. That's Response. why we've expanded the residency. That's why we have expanded the number of students who are being trained. That's why we've encouraged the nurses, the, the colleges, to expedite those uh, licenses. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. In Tuesday's uh, throne speech, the government highlighted its desire to put in place the conditions that will lead to the construction of over a million homes. We've seen that the lack of supply, along with the recent Bank of Canada interest rate hikes, are placing a strain on many young Ontario families looking to buy their first home. But it's not just potential home buyers, it's also people looking for rental accommodation in an increasingly tough environment. More often than not, delays caused by red tape, infighting at local councils, or simply bad policy have stalled construction of housing, be it rental, non-profit, long-term care, or even someone wanting to buy a home. Yesterday, uh, the government tabled legislation that would supplement the powers of mayors in Toronto and Ottawa. Specifically, I want to know how these added authorities help move projects along. Good question. I recognize the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Uh, thanks. I was pleased to announce that our government is introducing legislation uh, that is intended to give the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa the ability to move forward provincial priorities, select municipal department heads, and deliver budgets. We know that municipal governments play a crucial role in determining housing supply, and the reality, Speaker, is that over one-third of Ontario's growth in the next 10 years will come in the cities of Toronto and Ottawa. And too many families today are struggling with housing and the rising cost of living. We need to empower our local leaders with the tools that they need to get it done. We're also counting on them to cut red tape, uh, to build housing faster so that more Ontarians can realize the dream of attainable home ownership. Thank you for the question. The supplementary question. 
In fact, Mr. Speaker, the Toronto Board of Trade has said, and I quote, Toronto faces numerous urgent citywide challenges from housing, land use, transit, budget, and economic development. Effective, timely solutions require a city chief executive with clear authority. Now is the time to act, end quote. Minister, we have a vibrant province, and if our communities are to continue to thrive, People need to be able to stop dreaming of a home and know that they will have housing options, rental, nonprofit, single detached, condo, choice and options, and timely delivery as well, a clear path for residents and, more importantly, our municipal partners. Speaker, does the minister agree with the Board of Trade and does the legislation provide a realistic path to more homes, more choice, and housing predictability in Toronto and Ottawa? Good job. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. The member and the Toronto Regional Board of Trade are 100 per cent correct. Urgent action is needed to address Ontario's housing crisis. Too many families are already struggling with housing and the rising cost of living. We just had an election where we committed to Ontarians that we would build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. Increasing housing supply is a priority for our government, and we know that it is a shared priority with our municipal partners. Speaker, the changes, if passed, would help empower the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa to ensure that they drive priority provincial projects forward. And as our province grows, we need to ensure that communities keep pace. This will require bold solutions from all levels of government working together. Speaker, I'm proud to support Toronto Spons. and Ottawa as they cut through red tape, as they speed up development timelines so that more families can realize attainable yeah, home ownership. Yeah. The next question, the member for Ottawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Health. Critically sick patients had to be transferred out of Bowmanville Hospital when Lake Ridge Health had to make the unimaginable decision to close the intensive care unit there because of a staffing shortage. Shelley, an ICU nurse who worked in Bowmanville, stood on the lawn of Queen's Park and bravely told us what it was like to watch fellow co-workers make the difficult decision to leave the bedside in a health care system where nurses cannot take it any longer. Bill 124 has unfairly, unfairly suppressed wages and exhausted nurses feel devalued underappreciated and disrespected, and this after two years of COVID. We need the Bowmanville ICU to reopen. How will this Premier ensure nurses can stay and ICUs can stay open? And to reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our government uh, has a proud record of investments into health care, especially supporting our frontline health care heroes. Since March of 2020, we have added over 10,500 health care workers into the system. Mr. Speaker, this also includes investing in the first new medical school uh, in over 100 years in the GTA to ensure that we have in Brampton. In Brampton, in the Durham region, in Scarborough, to ensure that we have doctors and healthcare professionals into the future. And, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite have voted against each and every single one of those measures to support healthcare Order. workers and in increasing the health human resources in this province. We will continue to do what we can and ensure that we support our healthcare heroes across this province. The supplementary question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health. Speaker, people admitted to an ICU are really sick. Many have a 5 to 10 percent chance of survival. Womansville had to close their intensive care unit. They had to transport people sick enough to be in an ICU because they did not have enough nurses. It came with great risks. There is an easy solution that will keep hundreds of nurses on the job. Speaker, how much risk is the Minister of Health willing to take before she withdraw Bill 124? You know, I, I've said many times it is concerning, deeply disturbing, when an emergency room department or an, another department in a hospital must transfer patients. Um, the Bowmanville four-bed four ICU unit uh, was, of course, one such example. Uh, we don't want that to happen, which is why we have been investing 
in the province of Ontario in our health care system, including $3.3 billion, bringing the total annual investment in hospitals to over $8.8 billion in the province of Ontario. Specifically related to acute and post-acute, we've made an historic investment of $1.5 billion to support the continuation of 3,500 acute and post-acute beds opening during Response. the pandemic. Those beds will continue because we understand our population is growing. That's why we are making these investments in new hospitals in Ottawa, in Brampton, in Niagara. We're doing these investments because we understand the people of Ontario deserve no less. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Between 2003 and 2018, the previous Liberal governments allowed communities to develop webs of red tape, which led to frustration, disappointment, and ultimately drastically reduced housing supply. Our municipal partners, both in Toronto and Ottawa, have been calling our government to help them reduce this red tape while working with them to increase the supply of a mixed range of housing. It is abundantly clear to anyone that the leadership at the provincial level is essential if we are to assist our municipal partners in reaching our goal of over a million new homes as outlined in the speech from the throne. Uh, as a Toronto member, I'm keenly aware of the challenges of lack of supply, but at the same time, I am now more than ever looking for solutions that will have both immediate and lasting impacts. Speaker, specifically, how will a strong uh, mayor system in Toronto help address housing supply? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayors and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. Our, our government is providing municipalities with the tools that they need to get it done, and that includes working with us to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. That's why we're supporting municipal governments, which are ready to cut red tape and end the delays that have held back attainable housing for far too long. We're providing enhanced tools to the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa to get more homes built faster. These mayor oversee the two largest cities in our province that are projected to have over one-third of our province's growth over the next decade. They need the tools to prepare for growth and ensuring that the creation of new homes keeps pace with demand. Speaker, we're going to work with our two largest cities and other fast-growing communities that are shovel-ready, committed Spons. for growth, and ready to cut red tape. Supplementary question. Speaker, we know that more needs to be done to work with our municipal partners to strengthen our infrastructure, expand our transit networks, and most importantly, build more homes. Empowering strong mayors is a good start to addressing housing needs to help big cities like Toronto and Ottawa. But what is our government doing for the other municipalities across the province? Our government must work with other municipalities to ensure that housing development is a priority for all across this province. Speaker, is the minister taking any other action to help municipal leaders to identify and resolve problems that stand in the way of building more homes and building them now? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question. To help communities across Ontario build more attainable homes, Ontario is launching the Housing Supply Action Plan Implementation Team. The team will provide advice on market housing initiatives, including building on the vision of the Housing Affordability Task Force, More, Horm More, Horms, More Homes for Everyone Act, uh, and other government consultations. The government intends to appoint uh, Drew Dilkins, the mayor of the city of Windsor, as yeah. well chair, and, uh, and Mayor Cheryl Fort uh, from the township of Moosonee. Both Mayor Dilkins and Mayor Fort have both have excellent track records uh, for their service and success for the residents. Other team members will be uh, appointed in the coming weeks, with the first meeting to take place in fall. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I have been contacted by nurses in my riding of Thunder Bay Superior North expressing frustration with working in hospitals, continually short-staffed, 
while nurses from for-profit agencies are working next to them, earning two and sometimes three times their wages. How is it the Ministry of Health can justify limiting public sector nurses to a 1% increase with inflation near 8% while staff from for-profit agencies performing the same duties receive so much more? Good question. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I have to say that when I hear the member opposite talk about limiting opportunities, it concerns me greatly. We have a hospital system that has worked very well with their nurses associations, with their medical associations, to make sure that all opportunities are explored to make sure that they have the appropriate coverage in their departments, in their areas. Um, we need to continue that work. We have, as I've said many times, already expanded by 10,500 more healthcare workers operating in the province, working in the province of Ontario, including 6,700 to support hospitals in need. These programs support international health professionals and students, as well as redeploy medical residents and physicians to where they are needed most Response. critically. That work will continue, and we will ensure that we have a partner in our systems. Thank you. And the supplementary question. This government has created a crisis in health care as frustrated nurses leave the field in droves. Frustrated by a two-tier approach to wages, stressful working conditions, and the unfair measures of Bill 124, private agencies such as that owned by former Premier Harris's partner profit greatly on public dollars while full-time nurses are made to suffer. Will this government remove wage caps and end the health care crisis by ensuring we have full-time jobs with benefits instead of temporary and costly agency work? There you go. Okay. First John, the government house leader. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same with the NDP, right? It's, uh, it's all about personality, right, Mr. Speaker? So if they can't win an election based on policies, and we know that they Order. never can because they've only done it once Order. and threw them so far out to the curb and never gave them the opportunity ever again. So what do they do? They start attacking personality and individuals, Mr. Speaker. That's what the NDP is all about. And that's why they go from this to this to this, to where the NDP leader can't even bring it to himself to sit in the chair of the opposition leader, he seeks Order. refuge in the middle of his small, tiny caucus, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> we will stand up for the workers of the province of Ontario. We'll stand up for nurses, Mr. Speaker. We will build a better health care system, a better long-term care system, a better education system, a better transportation system, and we'll keep the economy moving. Order. <laughs> We're ready to start the clock again. Member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier, but first I'd like to congratulate you and all members in this legislature for your election, and I look forward to serving the people with each and every one of you. you Speaker, sir. inflation is negatively impacting all Ontarians, especially the most vulnerable. It's impossible for people with disabilities to live on $1,169 per month. An extra $58 will force them to continue to live in legislated poverty. It's wrong. Speaker, this is a moral issue. The people of Ontario want to care for the most vulnerable, and I would like and hope that the members opposite would as well. So, Speaker, will the Premier do the decent thing and double ODSP rates so that people with disabilities can at least live at the low-income cutoff? Minister of Finance to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite, and congratulations on, on your re-election and, and uh, serving the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, 
Uh, there's no daylight between, uh, I think, the member opposite and many of us to make sure that we, uh, in these very difficult times, when people are feeling the pinch, particularly most vulnerable, and people, for example, on disability. That's why, through the campaign, we said we were going to increase by an historic amount, 5%, the Ontario Disability Support Program. That's why we are adjusting it for inflation. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we kept that promise after roundly being supported by the voters of Ontario, and we, we tabled in the budget bill G2 the other day. Mr. Speaker, uh, many Ontarians are, are feeling the pinch. That's why that's just one part of a suite of Response. measures that we've taken to support the most vulnerable in Ontario, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. The supplementary question. Respectfully, Speaker, I don't think the minister fully understands the crushing cost of living in legislated poverty. Poverty and rising food prices are driving food bank use to all-time highs. Geopolitics, accessory grocery profits, and climate-fueled droughts are disrupting local food supply chains and pushing food prices through the roof. There are solutions, Speaker. Things like doubling ODSP rates, protecting local supply chains by permanently protecting prime farmland, legislation to stop price gouging at concentrated grocery retail markets. So, Speaker, will the Premier, will the Minister commit to implementing any of these solutions to make groceries more affordable for people, especially people living with disabilities? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, and with respect back to the, minister, uh, to the member opposite, uh, I would just point out that that was uh, the uh, biggest increase uh, in over 10 years for ODSP. So it's this government that acted. We made a commitment to do that. We Order. made a commitment to adjust it to inflation. And Mr. Speaker, it's just one of many things that this government is doing, not least of which is the community, Ontario Community Support Program, which you know also supports for vision care, for dental care, for health care, for, helps for, with meals, helps with prescriptions. It's also why we've put in the budget the fifth round of social services relief under the leadership of the Minister of Municipal Fair and Housing for supportive housing to help the most vulnerable, to help people with disabilities in this province. We're doing many things, and we will continue to do many things to help our most vulnerable in society as we work together to make a fairer society. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member for Kitchener South Hesper. Speaker, inflation continues to negatively impact families across Ontario with Stats Canada reporting a year-over-year -year increase of 8.1 per cent in June. As mortgage rates increase, so too does the cost of basic groceries, leaving many families in my riding and beyond worried about their future. Soaring costs that put pressure on families is not the way to build a strong Ontario. Carbon taxes, which increase the cost of fuel and virtually every other product a person buys, red tape and policies that restrict growth and reduce opportunity, could devastate communities and the hardworking people that are trying to build a life within them. Can the minister outline what immediate steps he is taking to support families across Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for that question. Uh, our government has been working tirelessly to rebuild our economy. We have lower taxes for lower-income Ontarians, and we've reduced gas and fuel taxes. Mr. Speaker, we negotiated a child care agreement to reduce costs for young families across Ontario. We eliminated license plate renewal fees, and for the people of Durham, we eliminated the tolls the previous Liberal government put on Highway 412 and 418. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we have continued to focus on building a strong economy by reducing taxes and fees for job creators. We have stabilized electricity rates. We have continued to invest in auto, in mining, infrastructure, construction sectors. Mr. Speaker, the road ahead is going to be uncertain. Global events in Europe and abroad are, are in our, in our uh, environment right now. But that's why we're making investments to transform our economy and unleash economic prosperity across the province. Together, let's build Ontario. Yeah, yeah. The supplementary question. Speaker, the impact of these rising prices always is felt the heaviest by the most vulnerable in our communities. 
We've already seen reports of increased food bank usage. The Daily Bread Food Bank in Toronto says it saw more than 170,000 visits in June alone, a record high number that it says is only expected to keep growing, and I've heard similar from food banks in my riding. Many of my constituents are now confronting cost of living increases that have them worried about opportunities for their children and the stable financial future of their families. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please tell us what concrete steps the government is taking to keep costs down and provide support for those most in need? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member is right, and this government knows the impact of rising prices is being felt all over Ontario, especially amongst the most vulnerable. That's why we are putting money back into the pockets of those who need it most. Mr. Speaker, we are increasing, as was just discussed, the monthly amount of Ontario Disability Support Program and adjusting future increases to rates based on inflation. Mr. Speaker, we're increasing the minimum wage, giving over 760,000 Ontario workers and in our 22, an increase and, and in our 2022 budget, Ontario's plan to build. We've lowered the low-income family and individual tax rebate credit, which will impact people making up to $50,000. That means for about 1.1 million people, an extra $300, Mr. Speaker, in their pockets through a tax break every year. Speaker, this government is going to keep costs down for workers, Response. families, and seniors, for the people of Ontario, and they can rest assured that this Premier and this government will have their backs. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Speaker, Speaker, the TSSA, my question is to the Premier. The TSSA is an agency responsible for administrating and enforcing the Technical Standards and Safety Act on behalf of the government. Their safety inspectors provide an invaluable service to our province and to public safety. They inspect every propane dispensing station, every amusement park ride and food truck. They inspect hospitals, construction sites, even inspect nuclear power plants. Speaker. These workers are members of OPSU Local 546. They've been trying to bargain their first collective agreement since February of last year. After 17 months of delays and stall tactics, they voted to strike in July. The TSSA claims it as a contingency plan in place to ensure public safety. However, they haven't been transparent about this plan, who's doing the work, or what the qualifications are. The question, Speaker, is has the Conservative government seen the con contingency plan from TSSA? And if so, what inspections are being done to ensure the public can operate safely? And what are the qualifications of those conducting the inspections? Great question. To reply, the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, the question. Mr. Speaker, uh, my ministry is aware of ongoing union negotiations between the TSSA, the OPSU, and the Society of United Professionals. Uh, the union negotiations uh, process is an independent process uh, between the TSSA, OPSU, and the Society. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as such, my ministry and I cannot intervene uh, in this process. Uh, the TSSA has advised us that it has prepared plans to ensure public safety in Ontario is not affected and impact to businesses is minimized in the event of a labour negotiation. Okay. Disruption. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, this is a public safety crisis. The strike started three weeks ago, and there's already been numerous safety incidents of concern. These include a fire at Canada's Wonderland, a propane explosion in Sault Ste. Marie, and just this past weekend, three children were thrown from a ride due to a malfunction in the Campbell, Campbell Ford Fair. With the CNE set to open next, public safety is on the line. Speaker, will the Conservative government demand that TSSA get back to the bargaining table and negotiate a fair first contract so our province's safety inspectors can get back to work? keeping our families and our children safe. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as said, uh, my ministry and I cannot intervene in, in this process, uh, but I can tell you that uh, TSSA has prepared plans uh, to ensure public safety is in Ontario is not uh, affected. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is as part of our pandemic response, our government gave over 2.4 million in financial support to the TSSA. Uh, this provided re uh, direct relief to businesses who faced significant operational Order. and financial impacts. Uh, we also reduced uh, permit and license fees by 75 percent for 163 businesses operating almost 1,000 amusement 
parks across Ontario until the end of this year. Response. Mr. Speaker, our government is building a stronger Ontario with the ground up, recovering from the pandemic and 15 years of NDP-backed liberal mismanagement of our province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor to Tumsey. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, just recently, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation released a very worrying report. In it, they stated that in order to reach housing affordability nationally by the year 2030, governments across Canada will need to take action, and up to 3.5 million more homes will need to be built. The report further states that increasing supply will be difficult. Critically, increasing supply takes time because the time to construct is significant but so is the time to progress through government approval processes. This delay means that we must act today to achieve affordability by 2030. Many of my younger constituents are concerned about the prospect of home ownership in the future. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Housing please explain what the government is doing to build more homes as the CMHC report called for? To reply, the Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question and, and congratulate him on his election to the People's House, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker, Ontarians are facing the rising cost of living and certainly the shortage of homes. But our government, Mr. Speaker, was re-elected with a strong mandate to help more Ontarians find more homes that meet their needs, Mr. Speaker, and their budgets. And we all know that Ontario accounts for two-thirds of the population growth in Canada. And that's why, under our ambitious plan, our government will build 1.5 million new homes over the next 10 years to keep costs down and make life more afford affordable for mm -hmm. all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. And we're also speeding up the approval mm -hmm. process while implementing recommendations from the Housing Affordability Task Force. Our steps, the steps that our government is taking, Mr. Speaker, are working. Over 100,000 homes have been built in 2021 Response. alone, and more than 13,000, Mr. Speaker, new rental starts here in the province of Ontario. That's the highest, Mr. Speaker, in over 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, next week I'm heading over to AMO in Ottawa to be able to continue collaboration with our municipal. Well, yeah. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, RBC's latest housing affordability report reveals that the housing situation in our province is the worst it's been since the early 1990s. RBC senior economist Robert Hogue stated, the Bank of Canada's forceful interest rate hiking campaign will further inflate ownership costs in the near term, putting RBC's national affordability measure on a path to worst ever levels. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please outline the immediate action that this government will focus on to restore and safeguard housing affordability in our province. Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker. Again, I thank the member for the question. Speaker, our government's policies have delivered historic results in getting more housing built faster and certainly complement our more than 4.3 billion investments over three years to grow and enhance community and supportive housing for vulnerable Ontarians and Indigenous people, address homelessness, and, Mr. Speaker, respond to COVID-19. More Homes for Everyone plan, launched in May 2022, outlines the next steps we're taking to address Ontario's housing crisis such as accelerating approval timelines and protecting home buyers mm -hmm. from unethical business practices. For example, changes were made to provide an incentive for municipalities to make decisions in timely manner on zoning and site plan applications. Effective January 1, 2023, if a municipality does not make a decision Response. within the legislated timeline, they would be required to gradually refund the application fee to the application. Mr. Speaker, municipalities could avoid lost revenues by improving processes to support timely decisions. We remain Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speakers. My question is for the Health Minister. August 6th and 7th, Monk, Mon the Montfort Hospital, the French-speaking hospital in our, in our riding, closed its uh, emergency department for several hours, and the problem was the shortage of nurses. This hospital exists because there was a powerful community movement which saved it from closure in 1997 from the Conservative government which wanted to close it once and for all. Speaker, does this government 
have any have the intention to go back to those uh, bad old days? Mr. Pell. Thank you, Speaker. We know that the Montfort Hospital in the Ottawa region is a critical hospital partner that will continue to operate strongly in the province of Ontario and in the Ottawa region. Specifically regarding the ER closing, as I've mentioned, whether it has to close for an ER, an, an emergency department has to close for two hours, a shift, or unfortunately over a weekend, there are processes that are in place to avoid in all possible cases that happening. In some situations, that cannot be the case, and there is a very clear process lays out what has to happen in terms of notifying first responders, notifying the community, and of course, the hospital continues to operate and have Order. staff there to redirect people to closer to nearby hospitals if and when an emergency does appear at their doors. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Regard, with respect to Montfort Hospital, you should answer in French to questions that are asked in French. I believe that francophones deserve that deserve that health services be provided in their own language. So, what must be done? I suggest we listen to what Gisèle Lalonde said. She was the head of the SOS Montfort campaign that saved the hospital many years ago. She said that we have to continue the struggle. To make heard, we had to fight them from here, and Toronto would listen because we'd fight so hard they'd hear us from Toronto. Question. Les gens sont, sont là pour des... People are there to defend the Montfort Hospital. What is the minister's? What does the minister have to say today, and in French? Such a pleasure to have the member back and, in a respectful place, have a conversation about how together we can work to ensure our health care capacity and the people of Ontario are served. I will say, Speaker, that as I mentioned in my previous answer, Montfort Hospital is a very critical partner in the Ottawa region, serving the people of Ontario. We will continue those partnerships. We will work with our partners. We are about solutions. They can talk about the problems. In the meantime, let's get the job done, which is what we have been doing and what we will continue to do. The next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. For nearly two years, the pandemic disproportionately impacted significant local events and festivals that brought our communities to life and the Ontarians together. In my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London, families and friends count on attending exciting events such as the Oxford Renaissance Festival in my hometown of Dorchester. We missed out on the fun and opportunity to share good times with friends old and new. These local events are always an important part, I repeat, an important part of social well-being. They also provide valuable support to our local economy and attraction for tourists that our businesses on Main Street always count on. Residents and local business owners have told me that even though Ontario has opened up, thankfully, they worry that they will never recover from the interruption and our local events won't be as widely attended as they have in the past. My question on behalf of residents, festival organizers, local businesses and tourists is what will this government do to support our unique Question. festivals and events after having been shuttered for so long? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, and to the member, we are investing more than $48 million to help festivals and event organizers carry out events to encourage people, travel, to participate and rediscover the beauty and diversity of all Ontario communities have to offer. Mr. Speaker, for this year, we have more than doubled the annual funding usually provided to festivals and events. We recognize the hardships and experience the sectors have suffered due to COVID-19, and we're giving a much-needed boost to ensure long-term success. Mr. Speaker, the investment of a continuation of a historic one-time COVID-19 recovery fund of 2021 includes $42.9 million for 547 festivals and events to reconnect Ontario program. That's a record number. And 5.2 million committed to marquee events through reconnect. Reconnect is supporting Response. events in every tourism region of the province. Events like the Oxford, 
Oxford Renaissance Festival, Travel to the Future Mural Festival, and Our House and the View from Here. Mr. Speaker, this is about driving business to communities and helping businesses get stronger. That's what we're doing. The supplementary question. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm very grateful for the successful applicants in my riding. However, I'm also aware that other applicants who did not receive funding are being left feeling discouraged. There is no question these events have suffered dramatically throughout this pandemic, and, the, and these investments provide organizations a significant boost. For many individuals, these local community tourism events are the main source of pride and camaraderie. No matter how small they might seem, they play a large part in the tapestry of what makes Ontario great. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport please explain the rationale why some applicants did not receive funding and what, as a government, we will do to support their efforts in encouraging tourism throughout this great province? Minister. Mr. Speaker, and to the member, let's not forget, all events are important to us, large and small. Given the unprecedented demand of the, for this year, not all events could be supported, even though we doubled the amount of funding available. We ensured festivals events of all sizes across the region of Ontario would, who received the new offer and improved experiences that will attract more tourists and drive greater revenue from visitors. Mr. Speaker, when, when 2023 Reconnect program launches, tourism advisors from my ministry are more than happy to sit down and discuss and support bids for Reconnect to make them stronger and more viable. But Reconnect is just a part of the government is doing to the economy recovery of the tour tourism industry. Through Ontario Tourism Recovery Program, we provided $100 million in critical funding to key tourism anchors in communities across the province to strengthen local economics Response. and secure critical jobs. Mr. Speaker, this is important, including the Ontario Staycation Tax Credit to encourage Ontarians to stay at home, spend money, and enjoy the great things on Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Windsor has some of the highest wait times for emergency room care across the entire province. I have heard from constituents that are waiting 20 hours to be seen. Nurses and other health care workers are burnt out, working multiple shifts back to back. And the minister recently blamed the same health care workers for the government-created crisis that we are experiencing. This conservative government continues to suppress their wages, forcing nurses to leave the profession in record numbers. Many in Windsor-Essex work in the U.S., where they are respected, protected, and paid appropriately. Will this government immediately repeal Bill 124 Order. and work to fix our health care system Order. rather than tear it down? The President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are thankful to our health care heroes across this province for the contributions they make and our record investments into health care, Mr. Speaker. Let's take a look at our record in the city of Windsor. For the first time, Mr. Speaker, this government is building, any government is building a new hospital in the city of Windsor. After, after 15 years of being neglected by the Liberal government, which the members opposite propped up, this government took action to build in cities like Windsor and cities like Brampton that were ignored. And unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite voted against a new hospital in, in Windsor. Windsor. Uh, we are going to continue to ensure Winter. that we build health care capacity across this province, whether it's building new hospitals in Windsor, in Brampton, in Response. Mississauga, uh, in Niagara, or across this province. And we hope that the members opposite can support that plan to build yeah. Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. To, back to the Minister of Health. CBC, CBC recently spoke to a Windsor resident that waited 19 hours. I wish the government side would listen because this is very serious. Thank you. CBC recently Order. spoke to a Windsor resident that waited 19 hours to be seen in the emergency department. She has been on a wait list to obtain a family doctor for a great deal of time now. Suffering from severe back pain, she went to a walk-in clinic that in turn referred her to the ER. She waited 19 hours to be seen and eventually was told that she has an 8.7 centimeter cancerous kidney tumor and blood clots in her lungs. I want to send this over to the Minister of Health so she knows that there is a crisis here in Ontario. 
We have a shortage of family and emergency department physicians in Windsor and across Ontario. It is imperative that Ontarians have access to timely medical care, to cancer screenings by a family physician. Question. Why won't this government finally do something to address the health care shortage? repeal Bill 124 and ensure that people have access to timely medical care. To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Through you, there is no one who thinks that a 19-hour wait in an emergency room waiting for a physician to, be, to see their patient is acceptable, which is frankly why we are doing so much. We've been seized with this. The Premier talked about this when we, in the throne speech, said we are going to build a better health care system in the province of Ontario because, frankly, the NDP and the Liberals didn't do it when they had the opportunity. We will make sure that foreign credentialed health care professionals get the opportunity to get credentials, to get their license in the province of Ontario quickly. We will expand. We've already expanded the train and learn and stay program so that nurses who learn in their community can stay and work in that community. We have expanded the opportunity for residency, for new grads to stay in the province of Ontario. All of this work Response. is ongoing, without a doubt. I don't find a 19-hour wait acceptable. I'm sure that you do not. But work with us to build up this system and be positive about what we have been able to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. The member for Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. M Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, in the past, the government had provided direct financial support to the hardworking, caring parents. Mr. Speaker, it was music to my ears when I heard in throne speech the government is again going to provide financial relief to parents, while the opposition has crit criticized this relief. We know its importance and its impact to the parents. Minister, why is this investment critical, especially now more than ever, when the parents are facing economic difficulties? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Mississauga Malton for this question. I think it is timely with the challenge of national inflation rising and the cost of living impacting every single one of our constituents. We have an opportunity in this House to provide additional financial relief, even if it is incremental, to make life a bit more affordable for the moms and dads of this province who have borne so much of this pandemic. And it's interesting, the member Davenport, as she criticizes me on the other side, said yesterday, quote, it's very disappointing. What is disappointing, Speaker, is that when, as legislators, we have a duty and opportunity to provide relief that we all stand up and we provide it to the parents of this province. Every one of us should be united by that mission. And it's sad, Speaker, that when we did this in August of 2020, $200 to every child. When we did it in February 2021, another $200 to every child. And when we doubled it to $400 in May of 2021, in each and every example, Response. New Democrats and Liberals oppose it, but this Premier will continue to make life more affordable. And the message to parents is quite simple. Relief is on the way. Supplementary question. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Thank you for thinking about the parents. Thank you for supporting the parents. It is the right thing to do, just like getting kids back to school so students can learn the important life skills. Speaker, to the Minister, while financial relief is on the way, what can students, like my own high school going daughter can expect and look forward to this September. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of education. Thank you, Speaker. In addition to supporting parents, yes, we have a plan for these kids to catch up, and it starts with them being in school this September and staying in school uninterrupted for the duration of the school year. Our mission is simple. It is a normal, it is a stable, and yes, a more enjoyable school year for these kids. They deserve it, and I know we all believe that. And in order to put that vision into practice. It's about having a plan to help these kids catch up. The most consequential policy we can as legislators achieve for these kids is keeping them in school and standing up for stability. Be it from the pandemic or from the labour negotiations, these kids deserve to be in school. In every reach of the province, I've heard the same message from parents. Get my kids in school and keep them there, and our commitment is to do just that, Speaker. Wonderful. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. The Premier passed legislation requiring long-term care homes to have air conditioning for residents in their bedrooms. 50, 15 percent missed the deadline. 
Despite this, almost 100 homes across Ontario have no AC at all. In June, July, and August, just days ago, temperatures were in the 30s, with the humid X nearly 40 degrees. In homes with COVID outbreaks, this meant seniors were roasting in rooms about 40 degrees for several days at a time, some having heat stroke and dying. Across Ontario, staff are overwhelmed, under-supported. Bill 124 continues to capture wages and force people out of the profession. He knew seniors were deprived of water. He knows they're being confined to their rooms for days, denied That's air true. conditioning and deadly heat wave. Clearly, clearly, seniors' care is not a priority for this government. Speaker, will the Premier finally make seniors in long-term care a priority? Announced today that being the Minister of Long-Term Care will no longer be a part-time job in this government, our seniors are depending on Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Oh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, talk about part-time. Let's look at the record of the NDP. The first time they started asking about air conditioning was when we were 90 percent of the way of getting air conditioning in every single room in the province of Ontario. Then all of a sudden it became important to the NDP, Mr. Speaker. That's when it became important. But here's the reality for the new colleagues who might not have been here. They actually voted against air conditioning in every room. They voted against it. They voted against adding 28,000 PSWs and health care professionals in our long-term care. He got up in his seat and voted against it. They voted against 58,000 new and upgraded beds for our seniors, Mr. Speaker. That is the shameful record of the NDP. Welcome to the party. We're getting it done for seniors. We're getting it done for health care. We're getting it done for the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, in a way that they never could and they never Concludes our question period. The Minister of Municipal Affairs has a point of order. A speaker, point of order. I'd like to correct my record uh, in response to uh, a question regarding our housing supply implementation team. I referred to uh, uh, Her Worship Mayor Cheryl Fort to the wrong municipality. She is the mayor of Hornpain, and I apologize. Good mayor. Too. Thank you. I recognize the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Rise on uh, Standing Order 59 to outlay the uh, uh, business for uh, the coming week. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just to congratulate all members on what was a, uh, a very fun uh, and uh, entertaining and uh, very fruitful uh, first week for the people of the province of Ontario, and congratulate all members on uh, on their on their uh, on their hard work. Uh, so on Monday, August uh, 15th, and on Tuesday, obviously, the House will not be sitting, Mr. Speaker, so that members from all sides uh, can attend the AMO conference uh, in Ottawa. We will re be returning on Wednesday, August 17th uh, in the morning, obviously. Uh, we will be dealing with Bill 3, the Strong Mayors Building Homes Act 2022. Uh, again, to remind uh, all colleagues uh, that we will be returning at 1 o'clock on the Wednesday. Uh, in the afternoon, uh, uh, we will be dealing again with Bill 3, the Strong Mayors Building Homes Act, Building Homes Act, excuse me. And then on Thursday, August 18th, in the morning, we will be dealing with Bill 2, uh, the Budget Measures Act, and again in the afternoon on the budget, uh, Bill 2 in the budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.